as I said, my name is Will, and I am with UW Extension here in Monroe County. Um, I work in community development, economic development, and natural resources development. Um, so what that means is I work with a lot of these folks. Um, and I am just, first off, if I may editorialize for a minute, I think this is a great event, and I think it shows that the Economic Development, Commerce, and Tourism Committee of our county board is very serious about Monroe County um, as a regional partner in economic development, and um, that you know we're here and we want to talk about this stuff. So I think they uh, deserve a big thanks for that. Um, so I'll let these folks introduce themselves, but uh, I'll just go ahead and, and say very quickly that you know these days so much of economic development is regional, um, and what I'm going to have our panelists sort of speak to, I hope, will be a little bit of their current work. Um, and then how do they fit into that regional framework? Because we have a couple of county level practitioners here. Uh, we have a couple folks uh, working at the regional level and then we have our regional development manager from the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. So um, we have a nice perspective from several levels. Um, and I guess if we would just like to introduce ourselves, we'll start with Terry and move down the panel. I'm Terry Whipple, um, Executive Director for Juno County Economic Development Dire uh, Corporation. Um, also president of our ILE Charter School, which is new this year, and past president of the Seven Rivers region, and that's it. Good morning, I'm Sue Noble. I'm the director of Vernon Economic Development. Uh, my office is in Westby, and um, we've, I've been organizing this organization for almost four years now. We're a very young organization, so. Looking forward to chatting with you more about what we do. Where'd you come from? Sue came from Juneau County. <laughs> <laughs> Trained by Terry Whipple. <laughs> and I'm Vicki Marcus, and I'm with the Seven Rivers Alliance, which is one of the regional economic development groups in the area. Hired by Terry Whipple from Juneau County. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm Brian Law with the Mississippi River Regional Planning Commission. I'm the economic development planner there. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're headquartered in La Crosse, and we uh, serve nine counties uh, from uh, Pierce in the north down to Crawford in the south, and including uh, away from the river, uh, Monroe County and Jackson County. Uh, my name is David Martins. I'm the regional account manager for the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. I have uh, a 14 county area that includes the Southwest Regional Planning Commission boundaries and the Mississippi River Regional Planning Commission boundaries, and temporarily six counties north of uh, Pierce. Uh, and by the way, Brian and I were not hired by Terry Lippin. <laughs> You're fired. To, I'm going to try to truncate, truncate this a little bit because uh, I think we have more to say than what my PowerPoints would indicate. But the Department of uh, Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, or the WEDC is easier to say, uh, we came into uh, existence in July of last year. I notice on the blue sheet they still have me down as the Wisconsin Department of Commerce, and the Department of Commerce is no more. Um, we've kind of been broken down. Okay. Uh, into several divisions now. Uh, before we were regulatory as well as economic development. Uh, so we had elevator inspectors, plan reviewers, ride inspectors, things like that, which really doesn't work well uh, with economic development. And now we're just purely economic development. One division that we have now is entrepreneurship uh, and innovation. Uh, that focuses on the uh, uh, early stage uh, entrepreneurs that's trying to help the people with good ideas uh, get their business going in Wisconsin. Uh, so that is a focus now, a separate division, um, dynamic uh, team there. So if the people have good ideas and uh, you know, well, you know they uh, have an idea that needs to be taken to a, another level, they're great people to talk to. Um, yeah. keep going. Okay. We also have industry development. 
in the past, we didn't have resources to focus on industry clusters. Uh, now there's uh, uh, emphasis on major clusters throughout Wisconsin. Uh, one of the key things that these clusters have to be organized, they have to have a plan. Uh, we have more opportunities than we have resources. So the real key, uh, the real key is to focus on those industries that need assistance. Now, one that I didn't realize, but right now in Wisconsin, for example, is a major shortage of truck drivers. Well, it sounds like it'd be easy to fill, right? You know, but it's not. So they focus with the trucking companies, tech colleges, the private trainers, etc. Because we need to, if you can't move your goods in, you know, to where they have to go, then you have really some issues in terms of your own economic survival and benefit. And they have obviously others, defense industry, medical equipment, but uh, these things are focused now. And as an aspect of that, they also do and still have an emphasis on minority business development. Uh, international, we've had that before with commerce, but now it's uh, really a heavy focus. I talked to a business yesterday that did okay during the downturn because they really focused on exportation of their goods to, you know, outside the U.S. Companies that export hire people at a faster rate. They are more economically viable in terms of revenue generation. So if a manufacturer has that capacity, it's really a plus. And so there's a major goal is to double the exports we have in the next uh, four or five years. Um, in the division I'm in, I'm in the division of economic and community development. Um, we have instituted, uh, located in Wisconsin, which will be a statewide site uh, uh, search uh, tool, so that because nowadays many of the people who are looking to move to Wisconsin, they do a lot on the internet before they talk to anybody physically in the state. A good example would be IBM going to Dubuque. Uh, they had trimmed down the cities they were interested in to 15 before they even talked to anybody. <coughs> and so the ability to present the properties you have, present the uh, workforce and other things of that nature for people to take a look at before they actually pick up the phone is where it's at nowadays. Um, the other thing we're focusing on, we have three of these in the state right now called regional revolving loan funds. The push is to bring the rest of the state into that same kind of a program. Um, commerce over the years, when, uh, and now the WDC, um, we have federal monies that we would make grants to, in the old days it was communities, more recently counties, and they would then loan the money to businesses they were larger projects, but when that, those loans were paid back, they were allowed to keep some of that money and create, you know, regional, actually not regional, but uh, local revolving loan funds. The problem is uh, a lot of those dollars are not employed. Uh, I know communities have a lot of money, but they don't have the opportunity. So we're trying to put together some regions so that there will be a regional revolving loan fund, which then can be used for, throughout the region and employ those dollars so that the smaller businesses that won't make it to our purview will have another place to go to get some gap financing to help put their projects together. The other benefit is, by the way, it will defederalize the money. And if any of you tried to use revolving loan funds uh, as they currently exist, you don't really want to use them for construction because of all the paperwork related uh, to Davis-Bacon and things of that nature. So defederalization and out of that, some of these uh, regional funds have created the Main Street programs for facade development, things that they can't do now. So there's a really an opportunity for that kind of a, of a situation. The, the, the key thing, uh, and I'll wind up my comments with this, is this is a partnership. We can do things at the, at the state level because we're now a public-private uh, entity. To give you a sense of the change, our advertising budget 
for this year is about one and a half million dollars. We have the ability to partner with other entities. We're just now getting that underway. Uh, in the last full year, Commerce's, I always jokingly call it the international marketing budget, was $22,000, which I think is about two brochures. But anyway, but so there's some opportunities here as a private, as a board that we have to report to as opposed to the, the typical government structure. Uh, it's key that we work with the regional marketing groups and the county groups, and in some cases where there's not a county uh, uh, economic development group, and I work with communities, but we're all in it together and we all do the different things that we do. Our focus uh, on our level is uh, industry, uh, manufacturing, technology. So I'll be here for most of the day, so I look forward to talking to you further about this. Thank you. <coughs> one more thing. I did bring some of the interim reports, at, uh, so if you see one on the table back there, feel free to take one. Thank you, David. And uh, next will be Brian Long. Right. Can everybody hear me in the back? <laughs> okay. I think that's yes. Um, <laughs> We can go to the first slide. Um, I was asked to speak about industry clusters. That's something that at the Regional Planning Commission we've been uh, involved in for several years now as a region-wide effort uh, at uh, economic development. The strategy that we've been following to uh, improve the overall economy, uh, it's, it's one strategy we've been pursuing to improve the overall economy of the region as a whole. Um, if you're not familiar with an industry cluster, uh, basically, it's a grouping of uh, private sector companies, uh, local or regional government, nonprofits, which usually takes uh, usually involves economic development organizations, and ec educational institutions together in one big group, and they make a concerted effort to uh, take on uh, undertake certain activities to improve the uh, uh, the global competitiveness of the companies involved in the uh, in the cluster. So. The private sector companies are interrelated in that they um, they deal in similar goods and services, and they have a uh, they share a pool of workforce and uh, suppliers that in common they're going to have uh, employees uh, who are uh, they're, they're drawn from the same pool of employees typically, and they're also getting supplied by the same uh, the same or similar companies. So they're connected and they're networked and they're interdependent uh, to start with regardless of whether or not there's an industry cluster organization, uh, these companies have developed this industry in the region naturally and organically. And that's very important with a cluster. You can't impose this from, uh, from outside. It has to already be existing to work. Um, the activities of a cluster are complementary and they're cooperative and they're collaborative. And al although these are private sector companies and they're, you know, they're, they're all out there competing, when they're they're not necessarily in direct competition with each other or if they are they're able to find ways that they can collaborate and when work cooperatively for their for the mutual benefit of all doing all this will lead to a more dynamic uh, local economy and I want to take a few minutes just to talk describe what that dynamism would look like when companies and organizations and institutions gather together in a cluster they begin to exchange information and capacities and workers and this exchange of information and capacities leads to uh, increased productivity and innovation. And so successful companies within the cluster will spawn new businesses. And this happens in two ways. First, uh, the established companies will grow and they'll stimulate the, cre the, the, growth, the creation and growth of a secondary economy and the suppliers and other support businesses that they need uh, to serve them. But the other way that these clusters can help spawn new businesses is that as the uh, cluster grows and becomes more successful, there are going to be employees at these growing companies who are, um, you know, they're, they're very talented, they're, they're kind of go-getters, and they're entrepreneurial, and they want to start their own business within that industry, either because they've got a new idea, or maybe they just feel like they've got a more uh, beneficial uh, way of going about, of, of addressing the industry and, and its needs, a better approach to the business. So it stimulates entrepreneurism in that way. And so as, the re as this happens and the region, regional economy grows and that, and that industry grows, it develops a critical mass of innovative companies and uh, workers will move to that region from elsewhere in the country and the world to, uh, to work for these companies or to start up their own uh, 
uh, businesses because they recognize that there's a, a very well-developed support system, uh, networks of, of, of companies, and that secondary industry that I, that I mentioned. So how does a cluster help foster this? Well, that's the three bullet points at the bottom of the uh, slide. They can en engage in joint ventures where they find something where uh, you know, th there's an interest they all share that they, that they can uh, get a better price from a supplier, for example, by, uh, by buying uh, in bulk together. They can do other cost sharing and grant partnerships. There's a lot of uh, grants that have, have been sought by industry clusters, especially for training. And together, as, uh, with the help of some of the uh, educational institutions and nonprofit members of a cluster, uh, these organizations can get access to and be more successful in getting access to uh, grant monies for, especially for training and for other things. And then third, they can exchange some of their capacity, such as their, their actual physical plant or some of their workers. If they have, uh, if one company has a group of workers that are idle or, or not at working at capacity, but another member of the cluster has great demand for that suddenly, they can work out an exchange where the, the one that needs the workers can contract with the other company and. Uh, they can do the same thing with, with floor space and equipment that's, uh, that's not being used to full capacity. So if that's how um, clusters are good for the members of the cluster, uh, these, are some, these are some ways that clusters are good for the regional economy around them. <clears throat> Excuse me. First of all, they can grow the region's economy by focusing on what are called traded companies. And uh, traded companies are those that produce goods and services that are sold outside the region, and thus importing capital to the region. The top economic challenge uh, that we face in the 21st century is how to create more jobs that pay family supporting wages. Traded companies tend to do this because they, uh, they make value added products and services that they sell outside the region. That allows them to pay higher wages for the very skilled and very in-demand workers. And um, these traded companies then stimulate a deep economic multiplier effect within the region because they require this, the presence of those secondary and supporting industries that I mentioned before. And also because these well-paid, highly skilled, in-demand workers uh, are, are paid well and they, uh, they support more local businesses because they have more disposable income. So because uh, local governments, nonprofits, even uh, private sector companies themselves have uh, limited resources to invest in their economic development efforts, they can get a good return on that investment by targeting the development of industry clusters around these traded companies because of that deep economic multiplier effect that those traded companies bring to the region. The second thing is that clusters can foster innovation in business startups. I mentioned this before. Uh, that information exchange is crucial. The critical mass, uh, get, get, getting enough companies together and enough workers in that industry together to create that critical mass is really how the success starts with a, with a cluster. And um, it's important, that information exchange is really important to look at because if, if companies are operating in total isolation, they're not necessarily going to get the information from others in their industry that could be helpful. But if you uh, put them into a cluster together, they're going to exchange information and they can learn from one another and benefit from one another's knowledge and experiences. This happens naturally, for the most part anyway, but when you put them into a cluster organization, this is a way to formalize and focus that effort. And uh, the third part is the uh, creation of high paying jobs. I, I mentioned that before, that, that uh, high, highly skilled and in-demand workers are going to be needed by these types of companies and they'll come to the area to work for those companies or to start their own businesses uh, once, the, once the cluster is really well developed. And so finally, I just wanted to mention that some of the cluster organizations we have in the Mississippi River region. Um, we have two formal organizations. First is the Equipment and Metal Manufacturing Association, or HEMA. And this, uh, this is an industry that has over 150 companies in the region. Uh, that employ more than 10,000 workers in our region. Uh, this is manufacturers of, of metal and equipment, machinery, electrical equipment, appliances, other things like that. Um, and this is a, a third of all manufacturers in the region are represented by the EMA companies. It shows that manufacturing is still a, a huge part of the economy in this region. Despite what we hear uh, statewide and nationwide about manufacturing, it's still a, a very much a key to the economy here. 
And then for the Food Resource and Agribusiness Network, or FRAN, is the newer of the two. And it is, uh, it represents over 85 <laughs> companies in food processing and other food production in the region. Who, and those companies uh, employ over 3,500 workers. And there are at least two other clusters that exist, uh, although they're not formally organized into an organization. That's uh, the wood and forest products industry and uh, healthcare providers <coughs> in this region. <coughs> So I think that's all for mine. Thank you, Brian. And uh, just a reminder, if you have questions, write them down and uh, someone will be around to pick them up. Uh, Vicki. Thanks. Um, again, I'm with the Seven Rivers Alliance, which is a regional economic development group. And how we are different from the Planning Commission is we're actually a tri-state organization. <coughs> When you look at our labor shed and our consumer patterns, um, several years go back to around the early 2000s, there was a study done and, and it defined our region um, based on those patterns, which of course everybody knows that people co come from across the river um, for our shopping, for work, so our region was defined um, on that tri-state basis. We are a nonprofit organization um, set up similar to a chamber of commerce in that we are membership based, but we do receive some private funds as well. And if you look at our map, we are intentionally borderless. And you can see our map on some of the materials that I have at our booth, but um, we intentionally draw without borders because when you start to draw borders in our region, some of our counties start to identify more. As you guys know, you, you may start to identify more with Eau Claire for, for particular things, Rochester. So we intentionally draw without borders because a lot of people just say, can we really identify with this entity more than yours? So, so we intentionally do that. Our membership is made up of private businesses, of luckily all of these economic development professionals at the table with me. Um, education is a member of ours and then also just resource providers and our motto is to connect businesses inspire innovation and strengthen the region and we do a lot of, um, of convening um, our, our the way that we do that is we look at the opportunities for our region and then we unite the different invested stakeholders uh, to really maximize those opportunities. So we'll bring together education, we'll bring together private business, very similar to what you see happening in the cluster models that Brian had talked about. To take a step back, and some of you have already heard me describe it this way, but, but I always describe our economy as a barrel. And at the top is that spigot, those traded companies that Brian was talking about. Those are the companies that bring in fresh money into the area. Their customers could be um, national, they could be um, global, but they're the ones bringing that fresh money in. It circulates from business to business, consumers to business around the economy, and then um, you also have pipes where it leaks out. And so from an economic development standpoint, the Seven Rivers Alliance, we're looking at ways to crank that spigot to get new fresh money coming into the area to make sure that that money is circulating around the barrel because to have it sitting isn't helping, and then to try and plug those holes where money is leaking out so that we have a very robust economy. So how do we crank that spigot? Um, one thing that we're going to be doing in the next several months is having a conference on global with two tracks. One is trying to get companies um, an introduction to global markets and how to even start. And then the second is there's tremendous opportunities by trying to connect our already global businesses, not only with resources, but also with each other. Because if they're starting to do um, business in Abu Dhabi, there may already be a, a, a company that isn't competing doing business in Abu Dhabi that they could share a lot of best practices with and just learning the culture, how they got in, all of those type of um, best practices. So we're gonna be doing that this upcoming year. Also, in talking to some of our key regional um, businesses, they are saying, we are having a, a hard time with attraction and retention of particularly IT people, because if a lot of you know IT people, those technology junkies, they love a very urban lifestyle. And, and in a lot of our marketing, we tell the beauty of our area, which does not appeal to those kind of people. So there are some efforts to try to um, grow our IT within our region because they've grown up here, they love the region, they know the region. Um, so we're gonna be uniting companies around that as well as I continue to hear, um, because we don't have an ability to grow within engineers, 
that there is a very difficult time attracting engineers and some of those very high skilled jobs to this area um, again because they because they see the other opportunities that they have but we really need to be very um, focused in how we attract that specialized talent um, another thing that just came on our plate a couple weeks ago is this um, idea of making this area a silent sports destination and obviously everybody knows the silent sports it's canoeing fly fishing um, you all know it you know tourism quite well and um, some people have said you know we have the assets here to really make this a destination whether it's big scale um, bike races all the way down to um, fly fishermen but doing a regional marketing and branding of this region as a destination and so our next step is to try and unite some of the stakeholders in that silent sports area and from an economic development standpoint those silent sports tend to attract those very high skill high wage people and so that ties in very well with our attraction and retention of talent to this area and then for all of us we all benefit because that's a quality of life issue and so what's um, starting to be identified is there are some weaknesses in we really need to link those silent sports organizations together to create that branding and at some point um, further on we'll probably need some funding to um, say these are assets these are weaknesses now let's start moving this forward um, into putting some um, some rubber to the tires Another piece that we're working on is access to capital. Number one reason why you don't have business startups is they always say there's not access to capital. And we are assisting the WEDC in um, convening those revolving loan fund meetings. But also there is a lot of talk right now amongst economic development professionals about this idea of loca vesting, which essentially is trying to engage individuals and businesses into creating a pot of money to invest in local companies. It's, Right now we have an angel investors group that actually hasn't made an investment in like three years. But those tend to be your high income people that like to do this as a hobby. But we believe, and a lot of our economic development partners believe that there's interest in other people contributing because there's nothing like having investors in the local coffee shop that might get a, get a discount by doing business there. But because they are, have, they're a stakeholder in it, they want to make sure that that's succeeding and they're going to make sure they're patronizing it. So, so we're in the initial stages of pursuing that. Um, we launched a bi-regional campaign in November that looks at uh, the pipes, the pipes where money is leaking and how we shore those up. And one of the strategies is to try and get our businesses into the um, purchasers of our major companies to make sure that we're making that connection. Um, we are a partner in uh, the cluster development with workforce development as well. Um, another cluster that Brian didn't mention is composites, and here's a great example of um, composites. The best example of a composite, of, of course, Matthew Bowes, everybody knows that, but, um, but fiberglass is a great example where you have a fiber and a resin and you um, bring it together. It's super strong, very lightweight, and the innovation that can happen by replacing products with composites is drawing statewide, and it should really be a tri-state thing, the state of Wisconsin is going nuts over our composite cluster. All of a sudden, there's a wind cluster that wants to come to the composites meeting, um, a boat manufacturing cluster, because particularly for boats, they would love to replace metal with composites because of the lightweight factor. There's also an organic valley set. If you guys can design a composite tanker, sorry, Walker, uh, that would be great because it saves on fuel. So. So that's an example. And the reason that everybody's attracted to this area is Winona State, uh, back in the mid 80s, recognized that there is a high concentration of composite companies in this, in this region. And they created the only undergraduate composite materials engineering program to directly feed students into the businesses. And so that is a tremendous asset that we have that um, the entire tri-state area um, now is discovering and wants to tap into. We unite our economic development professionals several times a year just for best practices sharing and uh, to bring in speakers. Um, we do the county's collaboration conference, which this past time focused on transportation. And one of the key pieces coming out of that is, for example, Organic Valley said, we cannot take our food global from Wisconsin because the rail system is not where we would need it to be. So at this point, we would be using our, our coast farmers to get our food out of out of the country, which is not what we want to hear in the state of Wisconsin. So there's a group focusing on trying to resolve that issue. 
We are a pilot to um, create a shared database with our economic development partners so that there's one set of data. You don't have everybody maintaining email addresses, phone, fax, contacts, whatnot. Um, so we're a pilot in creating that with the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. Um, also through them, we are assisting in making sure that that located in Wisconsin, the properties listing is fully utilized and doing business retention and expansion programs. And so my last thing is, how does this all affect you all? While all of this is happening, I'm a .8 staff person. Not even, not, I'm about 32 hours a week. So um, funding is always an issue to try and um, make all of, all of these balls stay up in the air. Um, we do receive 50% of our funding from um, private contributions. <coughs> Gunderson Lutheran, Quick Trip, and Western Technical College are very good to us. And uh, as you heard me say, we are membership-based. I have membership information at our table. And then we also have a compact that we launched last year that all of these people have signed. And it basically says we agree to work regionally, we agree to think regionally, and really be um, engaging in regional conversations. Um, last way is to connect with us. Our social media, our e-newsletter are just booming. This last 45 days I've had 100 people get connected to us through LinkedIn. So the, the key is people want to be interconnected, they want to be connected with us. Um, but I would love to start seeing you guys post things like job opportunities, um, ways that you want to connect with people through our, particularly our LinkedIn site, would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Sue? Great stuff. <laughs> so it's uh, very much an honor to be able to talk about what we're doing more in the local region after we come down from the state here. And um, a great partnership with Department of Commerce, former Department of Commerce, but Dave, um, and the WEDC, and also with regional planning in Seven Rivers, and regionally with Terry as well, and in Ordering County to us. I feel very honored to sit here and share with you some of the success stories that we've had in just our core short years of this organization. We're a very young organization, as I said before. And so I wanted to explain to you a little bit about my approach to economic development. A little bit different than being globally. It's more about, for me, it's more about uh, looking at your local strengths and what are your community assets and then building on those. So it's a very community based, asset based approach to economic development. And having said that, I, I want to just focus on three areas that are strengths for us. And one is, is partnerships. So there are a lot of partner partners in the room here. And, um, to see a number of them as I sit here. Um, of course, obviously I've mentioned Dave and, and Regional Planning and the Seven Rivers Alliance and Terry. But beyond that, there's uh, Patrick Reisman from the Department of Tourism. We do a ton of stuff with tourism and Patrick is almost always at our, at our council meetings. And um, tourism is one of the economic drivers for Vernon County and our region. Uh, mostly because in Vernon County, we have been listed at, on public radio as one of the top three areas in the United States for trout fishing because of our water quality in the West Fork River. So there's a ton of trout fishermen that come here from across the United States and bring a tremendous amount of growth to our economy and what, and what they bring. Uh, there's also the scenery that we have is just gorgeous in Vernon County. Uh, the hills and valleys and coolies that we have Kickapoo Valley Reserve, Wildcat Mountain. Uh, that is a tremendous driver to our region. I'm also working with the Village of Ontario right now to see how we can capitalize a little bit more on Wildcat Mountain and help revitalize that area of Ontario, Norwalk, and uh, the Wilton area. So being able to work regionally like that is, for me, um, much of an energizer. It helps me get out of the office and meet with folks out in the communities. More partnerships that we have are with our utilities in the region, Dairyland Power, XL Energy, my heroes here, Brian Roots here, uh, Department of Tourism I've already mentioned. Um, ITBAC is another major partner in a lot of the projects that, that we take on. They help us with a lot of grant money. Uh, USDA, obviously, Department of Ag, because we're such an ag-based county and region, they're a big partner for us. And also, Vicki mentioned um, private investors. They're very key to us because we are not a county entity, 
We are a nonprofit organization of 501c3, as I said before, funded entirely on memberships or what other kind of revenue I can bring in. So I've started an investor group based on sort of the slow money principles, and we've been able to utilize that group to be able to start some businesses and help some businesses grow through those local investors. So folks are out there that want to invest in your community. The key is to try and tap into them, get them organized, and create opportunities for them to be involved. So that's what we do. Um, the last one I want to speak about is our food and agricultural strength. We're also a partner in the Fran Group um, that Brian mentioned. And you may not know that we have 222 organic farms in Vernon County and 32 CSAs. So we do food. We don't do a lot of the typical manufacturing because we don't have the interstate, we don't have rail, we don't have a major airport, we don't have that kind of infrastructure. But we do have very creative people. We do have a very solid agricultural base. We have the national headquarters for Organic Valley and are a very strong partner in what we do. So a couple of the food related things I want to highlight is that we've created a um, multi-stakeholder cooperative called the Fifth Season Cooperative that grew out of a Bi local by Wisconsin grant that we were able to accomplish from the Department of Agriculture two years ago. And so the Fifth Season Cooperative, as I said, is a multi-stakeholder and it creates coordination between the growers and the processors, the distributors, and the buyers that want to move local food into institutional markets, such as Gunderson Lutheran, UWL, Western Technical College, a number of hospitals, Vernon Memorial, um, rural schools, a number of school districts want to buy local food, but they don't know how to get that into their schools. So the Fifth Season Cooperative provides that coordination it also has a Class B investor share. So if any of you are interested in investing in your local economy, I see some investors in the audience here, um, you're welcome to ask me later about some information about fifth season. For a minimum of $500, you can become an investor in our, in our cooperative and you can help grow the economy. So the other thing I want to mention real briefly as well is a uh, project that our organization took on in July of 09, we purchased a an abandoned manufacturing facility in Viroqua. It was the former NCR facility. It's a 100,000 square foot manufacturing plant and it sits on 15 acres in our industrial park. So when NCR announced that they were closing in January of 09, what was a real challenge to the opportunity to the community we chose to turn it into an opportunity. Our organization acquired that facility after seven months of, of negotiation with NCR, and we are now in the process of turning that into a multi-tenant food processing, aggregation, storage, and distribution center for food and wellness related businesses. We currently have three tenants in the building. There's room for plenty more. Um, we're currently implementing a $2 million federal grant that I was able to accomplish from the Economic Development Administration, and that is providing funding for the renovation of the facility. For example, we're putting on a new roof, a new HVAC, new plumbing and wiring, and repairing the docks, upgrading the restrooms, those kinds of things, so that it will be a much more attractive, tenable building, and certainly suitable for food-related businesses. So what we're accomplishing with that building is helping food-related businesses have a place where they can either start up or grow and expand their business by providing that infrastructure of a place that has the loading docks, it has common areas that folks can use like restrooms and training rooms and parking lot, green space, the docks. All of that is available as most of you know what a multi-tenant facility is. So we've had a number of businesses interested in that. As I said, I have three tenants in there already. The first one is Kiwaden Organics. They are a local grower of produce and they aggregate from 50 other producers in the region and they market their produce by uh, transporting it to Milwaukee, Madison, Chicago, and Minneapolis currently. So we're helping them find more new markets in the institutional markets through the Fifth Season Cooperative. We also have Fifth Season in there that has a cooler and they're going to be expanding into a wash and pack area as well. 
And then the third tenant is Lusa Organics, a little bit different. Uh, they use food-related ingredients such as sugar and honey and herbs and oils, and they create a value-added food product, but it, you just can't eat it. It's body balms and soaps and lip balms, but they're made out of food products. And they ship their products globally as well. They have markets in Russia, Australia, Costa Rica, etc., Japan. Um, they started in the basement of their house, and through our facility, we're able to help them expand. They've doubled their business since they moved into our facility last fall. So that's an example of what we're doing locally to build on the strengths that we have in the region. And again, I think the biggest thing is the partnerships that we have, and it makes it an exciting place to work, an exciting place to be. So I'd like to share more of what we do with all of you later. I'll be around for most of the day. But one of our major partners, again, is Juno County, obviously trained by Terry Whipple. So um, I want to thank him for his mentorship. And I'll pass it on to Terry. Thank you, Sue. Is this working? Great, Will? Yeah. Great. I don't know if you did this on purpose, but I don't know if you noticed out there the regression that we went through. I mean, Dave starts with the PowerPoint notes. Then we go to Brian with the PowerPoint. Then Vicki with her notes on an iPad. Sue with their notes on a napkin. Now we're down to just me and my mouth. <laughs> you know? But, uh, you know, I love to come listen to me speak because I never know what I'm going to say. And, Will, i got to warn you that most of the places I speak at, they usually have a delay and a mute button now. So, um, if you can hear me okay back there. But, uh, yeah, I'm Terry Whipple with Juneau County. We, uh, we really like to see ourselves as a 21st century economic development. I remember when I first came into it and uh, saw what economic development people did and all the beautiful brochures and all that kind of stuff. I mean, they were catering to um, you know, bringing in new businesses into the area, but that accounted for only about 1% to 2% of the new jobs for communities. I mean, the vast majority of new jobs we're coming from entrepreneurship and expansion of companies into new markets or new innovations. So we've really um, tried to um, develop ourselves as a community development, not just economic <coughs> development. Um, community development really includes tourism, uh, includes quality of life, includes housing, all the aspects, um, entrepreneurship, all the aspects that you really need to have a healthy um, community. I mean, when you think about what the future's like, um, even what today's like, we're in exponential change. Um, we needed, we felt that we needed to prepare our communities for what it was gonna be, but what was coming down the pike. I mean, our economy right now, it's global. Our economies are entrepreneurial. They're knowledge driven. If you can imagine, um, you know, that next year, 11, uh, what is it? Every 11 hours, knowledge will double. How do you prepare for that? I mean, most of you people graduated from college, um, some of you older gentlemen graduated from college knowing 75% uh, all that you're gonna need to know in, in the rest of your life. Today, it's less than 10%. But we also knew that we were gonna um, be in an economy that was volatile. So if you got that kind of rapid change, we felt that we needed to develop a culture that was entrepreneurial, innovative, and able to take those changes that were coming. Um, you know, it's no longer, you know, how big you are, how smart you are, but it's your ability to adapt that is gonna really uh, be the key to your success. So you can see where Juneau County, not only the Inventors and Entrepreneurs Club, which is spread throughout the nation, um, New York just added another club, and they give the credit to our area, to Juneau County, um, for developing that model. Hawaii now has a club. And I'm working with University, uh, UW Extension, to develop a virtual inventors and entrepreneurs club that we're gonna let go viral and uh, see how all these communities, even villages and cities are, are starting their own clubs at a grassroots level. And um, to try to build on that and, and see if we can make this thing global. Um, we've started an entrepreneurial leadership charter school now in Boston that we hope is a model that after we're, you know, through our first year that we can help other communities develop. I mean, these kids, it's just phenomenal what they're doing. We're helping them find their passion. What do they love? 
we help them understand what their true talents are and what talents they lack, where they need to find another way to, to make that up. And then allowing them to pick projects that uh, they're gonna love to do in entrepreneurism and leadership, and then they work all the curriculum into that project. And it's amazing, we have kids in geomedicine. We had kids that started out that wanted to play guitar that are now um, working with um, sound waves and all kinds of things. We, it's, it's just really neat to see these kids doing something they love. And a lot of these kids were the ones that fell through the cracks, you know, that didn't fit in our schools. But, you know, that's where the founders of Google and, and Apple and all these kind of places came from. Um, so we've got that kind of activity um, going on in Juneau County and trying to build that culture. It, it, I really give a lot of credit to uh, my board and also our county board, and Bonnie Peterson's here, president of JCEDC, but they allow us to really work in a regional environment and to share. You know, I just came back from Sauk and Columbia uh, visiting with them about um, entrepreneurship and how, what, um, you know, how we're doing our economic development, community development. I work close with Vicki and we share some of the things that we started many, many years ago, not only the Inventors and Entrepreneurs Club, but our region now, the Seven Rivers region, hosts um, one of the largest government contracting conferences in the state. Um, you talk about new innovations, you come to our I&E club, our Inventors and Entrepreneurs Club, tonight we have uh, people talking about nanotechnology. I mean, that's going to be the next um, internet, is nanotechnology and what, what it's going to do to transform our country. And we've invited our manufacturers, we invited our businesses, as well as people that are entrepreneurs and innovators that want to tap into it. So we believe that, um, you know, the last thing we do is try to, you know, try to bring a company into our area because that just seems to happen naturally. But I think we've built um, a culture, a base of people. Like I've said many times, it doesn't matter if petroleum prices spike to the moon because to our region, it just means new businesses um, in alternative energy. Um, it doesn't matter if uh, steel becomes so expensive because China's taken it all. To our area and region, it means new businesses and composites and bio composites and bio resins. And it doesn't matter if they say, you know, antibiotics aren't going to work anymore because in lacrosse, they're working on new compounds from mushrooms that will replace some of the antibiotics that don't work anymore. So it doesn't matter to me if the economy tanks when we have a base of people that are entrepreneurial, inspired, and supported, because even if the economy goes down, we have people that as old dies away, mature companies, we have the ability to you know, grasp those new opportunities that are springing up everywhere. So that's my speech for today, Will. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Okay. Uh, Will, can I, can I, over here, no. sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Somebody speaking. Um, I want to say that from a regional perspective, these two individuals didn't really toot their own horns very well, so I'm going to do it for them. Sue, both of them are tremendous assets for our region, and they have gained us national attention. Um, Sue alone, you met President Obama, correct? For, so she um, was recognized for her efforts um, to, for economic development in rural areas, particularly in this food processing capacity, and Terry Whipple, um, he is recognized nationally for this inventor and entrepreneur, uh, this entrepreneurial spirit startup. So these are um, two assets in our region as well that are also part of our brand. And so thank you for your efforts. Thank you, Vicki. Um, well, <laughs> so as we, as I think we can see from the panel, you know, uh, what we kept hearing a lot of was asset based you know, let's grow what we have here now organically as much as possible. And, you know, which I think is instructive because for a long time economic development was very much about the idea of what's, you know, called smokestack chasing. These folks are really talking about what do we have here? How do we grow that? Um, and so I have a couple of questions here from the crowd. I'm not going to be able to get to all of them. I apologize for that. But like, uh, like we said, we will um, do our best to get you an answer. Uh, and I have email addresses, so that's great. So our first question for the panel um, kind of goes back to the idea we, we talked about a little bit about marketing and, and that kind of thing. Uh, how can a county 
with a small population of highly skilled workers, comparatively small population of highly skilled workers, attract businesses. I don't, sure. We did some marketing last year. Seven Rivers Alliance had some funding to do marketing last year. And the difficulty is to do general marketing is like chasing those smokestacks. You see very little return on your investment. And where our best, in my opinion, where our best um, marketing opportunities are are around these cluster strengths that we have. And an example that I keep throwing out that we have yet to develop is, for example, um, the composites example that I gave you. Um, if we, there is tremendous potential, and they believe it's possible, to be recognized as like a Silicon Valley for composites. Well, some opportunities for branding this region exist around that. So if we can uh, determine what are the key um, trade shows in which they're already at, perhaps we can get them to co-locate and then brand that area as kind of the Seven Rivers region composites um, cluster, if you will, and do some branding around that because there's tremendous business attraction around trying to come and tap into our already trained workforce, into the resources that we're providing our companies, and so it gives a very targeted approach with tremendous potential. I'll take the next. <clears throat> it, I could go on all day on this kind of stuff, because I tell you, um, and Vicki's right, I mean, you've got a skilled workforce, why not tap into them for their talents to start a new business? You know, it reminds me of a story, and it's a true story. I remember when General Motors collapsed down in Janesville. I remember talking to a high-level official at the state, and it was sort of a woes me. Um, you know, look what's happened. This is terrible. And I said, no, there's another side to that story. I said, you know, just last night at our Inventors and Entrepreneurs Club, Claire up here in Juneau County, we had five engineers from that General Motors plant that were as giddy as school kids about starting their own business in a new type of innovation where they can compete worldwide and then employ new people. You know, so when you have the implosion of a General Motors and you have empower those people, those talented, skilled people in entrepreneurship, you've got an explosion in new businesses that can compete. So I'm always saying, you know, look within. Look what you got right now. And I would echo that as well. I mean, asset-based, you know, grow your own businesses in your local community. Those are the folks that are going to stay in your communities and join the PTAs and join, be involved in your churches. They're going to grow your communities, increase your quality of life, just make this common sense. So we experienced the same thing when MCR announced that they were closing. We lost 81 jobs that, and supposedly they were supposed to go to Tennessee. One job went to Tennessee. I had a flood of folks coming into my office to say, eh. I say, how are you doing? Well, first I was devastated, but you know what? I've always wanted to start my own business, but I didn't think I could give up my job. Now I don't have a choice. Now I can start a business. So thus, thus we took on the challenge of building and creating a multi-tenant facility, and people are still flooding into, I mean, I've got six more tenants on the string. People just really want to get out there and start their own business, double their business if they already have one, but the exciting thing for me is watching our own local businesses, our own local entrepreneurs, be a part of their own economic solution. That's what it's about. Let's start motivating and empowering our own local people. So that's what I know we all do here. That's our philosophy, but that seems to be the common thread. Yeah. I would add, too, um, there's a couple of strengths that Monroe County would, uh, has that it can uh, tap into. Um, one is uh, the presence of Fort McCoy, and that's going to be, in, uh, there's going to be a lot of influx based on just the nature of military life. People are coming to this region from elsewhere. Uh, some of them are going to decide to stay. And I would be actually very curious to see how many uh, business startups in Monroe County and in the surrounding counties are started by people from outside the region who come here because they were in the military. They came to Fort McCoy for some training, or maybe they were stationed here. And they loved it, and they decided they decided to stay. The other thing that Monroe County should do is look at the strengths that it already has. Uh, I mentioned manufacturing earlier is one of the is still one of the major uh, cornerstones of the of the economy. Vicky talked about not letting uh, uh, economic activity leak out of the of the area. There have got to be manufacturers in any area who are having to buy supplies or some raw material or something like that outside the region. 
maybe that can be done here. That, that's an opportunity for entrepreneurism right there. Uh, that, so that, those are two things that came to mind uh, during uh, uh, everybody else's comments. From the state perspective, uh, growing existing businesses is really what we focus on. Uh, that's why the efforts in manufacturing and exporting, you've already got the talent, you've got the, the products, but you can help them grow by helping them find new markets for their existing products. So that's the key is, is really focusing on what you have we, of course, will welcome any business into the state, but that's not where the long-term growth is. People who are here already know their environment, they know the people, they know their, you know, their surroundings, and their, you don't have to convince them to be here, but maybe you have to help them take that next step. And so I think that is a, a key focus of, of EDC. Um, thank you. And, and I would just add as well, um, definitely if you're interested in the entrepreneurship stuff, attend Terry's Club, attend Sue's Club, come to my, our humble Monroe County Club uh, one of these months and, and just see the, that model in action because it really is a neat thing um, and it really is economic gardening. Uh, it's what we're working on. Um, okay, this next question, and this will be our last question, we've got about 10 minutes, we'll be wrapping up for break at 10.15, um, is kind of specific, so I'm going to massage it a little bit into a question a little more about general transportation policy. The question is, um, what happened to high-speed rail to aid in tourism and transportation, and how do we get it back? So maybe if we talk about the high-speed rail a little bit, but also just transportation in general and infrastructure, what do we need to help grow that economy from a transportation standpoint? I think $10 gas ought to do it. <laughs> Okay, $10 guess. I'll give an example. Um, it's not really a broad solution for lots of folks, but one of the, we found transportation to be one of the major obstacles when we were working on the, fifth, the development of the fifth season cooperative. We were working with the growers who knew that they wanted to get their, their produce out there, their food out there. Um, we also are working with the buyers that want to buy it. But how do you get it there? And how do you get it there under all of the quality assurance kinds of things that need to happen? How do you get it there through all the insurance that needs to happen, all the liability kinds of stuff? And so one of the things that we worked on was a partnership with Reinhardt Food Service. So in November, Reinhardt Food Service became a distributor member in our cooperative. So now you can actually go into Reinhardt's books. Any institution can go in there and look under the homegrown book and they can um, order produce through fifth season and it will be delivered by a Reinhardt truck. So anybody who is already in the Reinhardt routes can get it on their truck through our, our growers can be on that truck, but they can also, Reinhardt is doing backhauls from our building into other institutional markets. So we looked again to what are our local strengths in our region. Reinhardt is a major one. They're very interested in it and also Mike DeVore was the president of the lacrosse division here. Some folks don't know Mike, but he um, was very interested in the cooperative and chose to run for the board and was elected just last month as a board member for the fifth season cooperative. I think that's huge. So that's one way that we looked at the distribution thing. We're never gonna have the interstate. We aren't gonna probably have high-speed rail, but we can look to our local partners that already know how to do it and partner up with them. Vicki? I'm going to look to Jenny here because when I came on to the, um, the Seven Rivers Alliance, uh, LADCO, La Crosse County Economic Development, was already working on this. But I do know that we had a somewhat, sure, I'll just pass, yeah, she'll give you accurate information. So Sorry to step in. Um, I'm Jenny Cooter. I'm the Associate Director of the La Crosse Area Development Corporation, also uh, one of the facilitators of what we have uh, been calling the Empire Builder Coalition or Empire Builder High Speed Rail Coalition. Um, as you all know, back uh, last December, uh, our immediate aspirations for a high, higher speed rail through Wisconsin uh, took a little bit of a turn uh, with the, the deviation of the federal funding. Um, there's differing opinions on, on if that was, was good or not or the right decision or not, um, but, but that being what it is. Um, what we have chosen to focus on 
instead and what actually is moving forward is the quest for more frequent rail service. Right now, the Empire Builder Road, as you know, runs from Chicago all the way to the West Coast to uh, Seattle and Portland, Oregon. Um, there's only one train that goes each direction each day. Now, there's a lot of demand actually out there for folks to get on in La Crosse or Tacoma and go to uh, Madison, or go to, well, it doesn't actually go into Madison, but go that direction to the east, to Milwaukee or to Chicago or uh, to the west into the Twin Cities. Uh, the way the configuration is right now, it is impossible to get to any of those destinations in a single day and return. Uh, if you go to Milwaukee or Chicago, it's automatically a one night trip. Um, the way the train schedule works, if you're going to the west to the Twin Cities, it's automatically two nights overnight, um, unless you just want to be there to sleep, basically. Um, so what we are working on is uh, actually a study. It's going to be a cooperative study with the, the two departments of Transportation, Wisconsin and Minnesota, um, partnerships with communities along the corridor, uh, to look at the feasibility of adding a second train to the existing corridor, traveling in each direction between the uh, Twin Cities and Milwaukee. Uh, there's also already what's called the Hiawatha Corridor that serves uh, the Milwaukee to Chicago Corridor when they believe it's something like uh, eight or nine trains per day. So, so there's quite a bit of service there. But if we could add a second train traveling in each direction on the rest of the corridor, that would um, really increase the, the feasibility, the viability of rail transit. Um, and at what time then in the future that, that uh, you know, the economic recovery happens, there is funding available for implementation of higher speed rail. We've already built more of that rail ridership culture um, and really improved the, the business model. Um, another uh, another uh, good news for our area uh, a few months ago was that the study that actually was funded as part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act to study which route was the most viable route for high-speed rail at what time it does go forward. That was completed and it was actually led by the uh, Minnesota Department of Transportation. The Federal Railroad Administration actually agreed with MnDOT's recommendation that the existing Empire Builder route that comes up from Milwaukee through Toma here into La Crosse, across the river, and, and up along the river into the into St. Paul uh, is the preferred route. That, that is the, the most um, environmentally and economically sound model at which time that goes forward. Sorry to interrupt, but I wanted to share that. No, oh, thank you. That was great information. Uh, we are running right up against it. Do we have any last comments? I would. I was going to say what uh, Jenny said more eloquently about uh, more frequent rail service being very good. Also, uh, but in terms of general transportation, uh, it's not just about um, the, the interstate. There's also rail and barge travel in the region as well. I know that the uh, the barges along the Mississippi River have just been begging for uh, for customers uh, in the past. So. That may be a more viable uh, route for some uh, some products. We should keep that in mind as well. Thanks. All right. Well, one more round of applause for our panel.